Hello everyone. I'm Sarah Dodder. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the DEI coordinator at School Social Work. And I'll let our panelists um, introduce themselves. This is the Native American Heritage Month panel. So glad to have all of you participating, our two panelists here. Um, we'll start with Jolie. Manuhu, everybody. Inania, Jolie Varela, Numunu, Payahunaru Yesh, Tuli River, Nukimaru, Ibia, Tony Spoonhunter, Imoa, Anita Spoonhunter, Sao Namati Nu. Hello, hello everybody. My name is Jolie Varela. I come from the place of flowing water and Tuli River. My mother is Tony Spoonhunter and my grandmother is Anita Spoonhunter. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the founder of Indigenous Women Hike. In 2018, we started our first journey on the Numupoyo, um, also known as the John Muir Trail, uh, a group of indigenous women um, traveling in ceremony underneath the um, American Indian Religious Freedom Act without permits because these are our homelands and we shouldn't have a have to need a piece of paper that allows us to uh, travel and have ceremony on them as our people have always done. So I am the executive director of Indigenous Women Hike, but I also sit on the Eastern Sierra Pride Board. Um, I am a fat, queer, indigenous woman. Um, I do other work in my community. I sit on various boards, uh, one for the Hills Environmental Stewardship Board here in my community um, in Payahunaru, also known as the Owens Valley, but Richard Owens never stepped foot here. And I'm really grateful to be able to uh, come and have this conversation and and be invited after uh, it had to be postponed for a year. Uh, I also think that it's important to um, recognize and speak on the privilege that I do hold as a light-skinned um, Native person. I am often are often afforded uh, more more easier access into certain spaces, like in the outdoor industry. So I, I think that it's important to, to, to name the privilege I do have. So Manahobu, uh, thank you for having me and I'm excited to have this convo. Thank you. And Cliff. My name is Cliff Matias. I'm Quechua and Taino. I'm here in Lenape Hoking in New York City. Um, I am the cultural director of the Red Hawk Native American Arts Council. I am right now driving into New Jersey. Um, kind of got caught, it's Native Month. And um, this is, I think, my fifth speaking engagement today. So um, I, 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 uh, I have you know, done a lot of things with Columbia and, um, and uh, Barnard University in the past. And so I'm always grateful that they ask me. Um, I've been in this work for over 30 years. Um, I was inspired in 1992 at the um, 500th anniversary, and that really kind of really just inspired me to start uh, my work in activism and, and being part of founding an Indigenous Arts Council here in New York. Um, I have been uh, a water protector. I was at Standing Rock uh, on two, two, two visits to Standing Rock and two visits to Mount Achaia. I also been up on Oak Flats and Bears Ears and also um, the Ramapo Camp in, in uh, Mawa, New Jersey. Um, and I know I'm missing something. Uh, I've been uh, in the Amazon with the Yanomami, um, I oppose. So I have done uh, you know lots of work in these 30 years of standing up. I've also been on line three um, and trying to uh, be an activist as well as a good uh, citizen of uh, the indigenous communities. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's Native Month, so uh, just kind of a busy, you know, busy time, but never that busy that um, I feel, you know, overwhelmed in this work. Well, I extra appreciate both of you for being here. Um, as it sounds like it's been a busy month, um, and I imagine it's been a busy month for you too, Julie. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so the first question, just kind of the where where we always start with these Heritage Month panelists, 
what does Native American Heritage Month mean to you? Why is it important to to honor this time? And of course, this is not to say that you know it, it's not important year round. Um, but what does this month in particular mean to you? If either one of you want to go first. I can go ahead and go. Um, so it's been changing every year for me. Um, I, I like to think of it as a time where, um, you know, non-Indigenous folks can uh, edu educate themselves um, to what's going on in the Native community, Indigenous communities. And for me specifically, um, it is a time of year where I, I um, ask that non-Indigenous folks pay reparations to Native communities um, on, on lands that they're occupying. Indigenous Women Hike does a um, big Thanksgiving fundraiser and where we ask for reparations and we've created a scholarship, a $10,000 scholarship, a water protector scholarship in honor of our late elder, Harry Williams, who did so much water work here in Payohunaru. And then we donate to the youth council and to various drug and alcohol programs here. We fill up our um, free libraries with food and books and hygiene products for everybody. So uh, I usually celebrate in different ways for myself. One year, I didn't take any speaking engagements or anything because I thought, you know, this is my time to rest and to just kind of um, reset and let other people, non-Indigenous people do this work for themselves. Um, and then some days I, or some years I take up, take on a lot. Um, but it's just ever changing to me what, what this month means. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that Native people can celebrate uh, Thanksgiving because we know that Thanksgiving falls in uh, this time in, in whichever way they want um, and reclaim that for themselves if it means that they want to celebrate with their families and eat food um, or they want to fast that day. I've kind of done done everything. So uh, Native American Heritage Month is just changing. Uh, one year it meant something to me and this next year it meant something different. So uh, I'm just kind of always pondering it and thinking about it. So this year specifically, I'm just using the time to, uh, you know, raise reparations for my community. Thank you. And I, I really do love that part about some years you're like, nope, not doing anything. Um, this is a month for me. But yeah, Cliff, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, you know, for me, I mean, Native American Heritage Month has always been just a crazy busy time for me. Um, and supporting the indigenous artists that are part of the council, um, a good opportunity for them to uh, get out into the communities, um, other than indigenous communities, a, a chance for them to uh, get their messages, let people know, you know, who we are, that we still exist, that, you know, it, it comes, um, you know, right on the heels of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, and more and more of these um, corporations, universities, um, uh, even towns, right, um, have now sort of trying to like sort of take this narrative from us. And I, and I always remind them, I say, you know what, Indigenous Peoples Day is a day for us. It is our day that we celebrate. It's, you know, it's no one else's narrative but ours. You know, in, you know, Native American Heritage Month is the time for them to put to host events and bring Native organizations in or Native speakers, or um, and that's that's a good time for that. But Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, I always feel like that's a day that we as Indigenous people come together and have our voices heard um, in venues that we create. So, like here in New York City, we we have an Indigenous Peoples Day event in Randall's Island for for two days. And, um, you know, it's our opportunity to bring our indigenous voices um, and creating a venue that we, that we have, you know, we have created. Um, and so, you know, that's that's gone over pretty well. But the month itself, um, you know, this is the first time that so many corporations and uh, government institutions have hit us up, um, you know, at the council. In a, 
in numbers and droves that I've never seen before. And um, I know, and, and it, so, you know, it's, it feels kind of nice to, to know that, you know, all these corporations are now taking, you know, indigenous voices seriously. Like they want to hear what we have to say. Um, it's not enough that they're just sending out some emails and, you know, honoring native people or, or their, their, their land acknowledgements. Um, but bringing in indigenous people to do that. And um, and so, you know, I think it's a it's a move in the right direction. I wish um, I had the the um, I mean, I'd love to take a, a month off, like, you know, one of the years of indigenous people's day or you know, native month, whatever, and take it off. I'd love to do it. Uh, it just, you know, it's just for me, um, because I run this arts council, there's so many artists that uh, we get you know, work for during this time and support the community. I, I'm never really uh, able to, but, you know, I, we still have like, I mean, the, the, our programs have moved into December that it's so busy. Um, so, you know, Native American Heritage Month has now become, the, you know, the first two weeks of December for us. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, I think it's great that, um, I mean, you know, look, it's November because of Thanksgiving and or Thanksgiving, right? Um, and and all that nonsense. But really, that was never the idea. You know, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln created Thanksgiving. He never was thinking about pilgrims or Wampanoags. He was just thinking about Americans coming together. So if if America would just you know remove that that silly story um, from 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 their vocabulary and sort of stick to the the original idea, right? I mean, as indigenous people, we all have dozens of Thanksgivings, you know, whether it's green corn ceremony or uh, you know, Inti all the different celebrations that we give thanks for. Um, Americans have this one day, you know, and, um, they, you know, we really need to just, you know, completely move away from that. But that's the reason why it's in November nonetheless. But, um, you know, it just, to me, it just means uh, uh, opportunities to, um, to educate the, the non-educated on indigenous rights, issues, uh, cultures, traditions, and history. Yeah, thank you. And that, that reminds me of one of the other questions I had, which your response kind of leads into it, is what is something or what is something else maybe you wish people understood about your experience as an indigenous person living in the United States? I think that one of the things I think about a lot is um, pan indigenization, and you know we a lot, we come from our our communities are very diverse. We have our different languages, our different ceremonies, our different songs, our different creation stories. So um, you know when they say sometimes the indigenous community, we all kind of get lumped in. But I wish that people would realize that um, we are very diverse communities and where I'm from in so-called California um, there are you know over a hundred different tribes and uh, we all have our own languages and stories and so it, I think that's really beautiful too um, to know that we do have such diverse communities so I wish that people would kind of understand that um, and what else? Another thing that I kind of wanted to to speak to um, is, you know, when we were talking about uh, people celebrating Native American Heritage Month and and even corporations and um, how kind of Cliff was saying that, like, it's great that these like corporations are taking notice and know that it's important to um, to acknowledge us and to celebrate this month. Um, another side I think that is important too is to have people, you know, to like question the authenticity of it sometimes. I think that sometimes people are just kind of checking a box like, oh, it's Native American Heritage Month. We better do something. I'm going to contact this person two days before 
and, you know, ask for some information. I think it's really important to be intentional about that. Like, no, Native American Heritage Month is coming up in three months and four months um, and a year from now. You know, let's be intentional about how we're inviting these people to come into this space and how we're going to uplift their work and how we're going to share about this work and how my, this corporation or this organization um, is really going to be intentional or intentional about supporting Native communities during this time. Um, because I have gotten some asks where it was like, like, hey, we want, it's, it's already November and we want to spotlight you. So I'm going to need a two by three photo of you with the email of the person who took the photo and two posts from your Instagram page and this so we can feature you for Native American Heritage Month. Um, and these are sometimes from accounts that aren't even following the work that uh, is done on Indigenous Women Hike. So it doesn't feel authentic to me. Um, and that's when I tell them this doesn't feel very authentic and I'm going to have to opt out of this this share. So hopefully like next year they know um, to be more intentional or intentional about the ways that they're going to share during uh, Native American Heritage Month. And that's just me. I know a lot of us um, are different in our ways of thinking, but uh, that's something that I wanted to share. Like, yeah, it's great to be, to have Native American people be spot spotlighted, but like in how was this intentional and how are are they going about doing this? So um, just wanted to share that and put that out there. You know, it's funny that you say that because like I got hit up by a, a major company um, that wanted to do, you know, their, what they wanted to share with their employees for Native American Heritage Month was making dream catchers. And I was like, so it's Native Month, you want to teach your employees or, or you know, educate your employees to who Indigenous people are today, our causes, our issues, um, what's important to us, um, understanding, uh, you know, breaking stereotypes, so on and so forth, whatever. And so this, so you're selecting to make dream catchers, you know, and um, like I really had to have this like deep conversation with them. Like it wasn't a one day conversation, um, you know, like. It, it's just amazing like that, you know, that was what they were going to contribute to the the education of their employees as to who indigenous people are. Uh, you know, I did I did talk them out of it. And, um, you know, they re replaced it with a with a with a, uh, a virtual you know lecture. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I mean, it it it. it it definitely um, the intentions uh, for some of these organizations, and they do the hit you up a day before, um, and even learning institutions. You know, a lot of learning institutions. I was just talking about this with uh, my colleague uh, Katie Isenock. It's Katie. She's she's driving while we're, <laughs> we're we're coming back from speaking at a university together, and Katie is is uh, Lakota from uh, Rosebud. But, and uh, we were just talking about that, that, you know, so many of these learning institutions want us to dance and, you know, and, you know, want all this like sugar coated sort of um, programming, you know, and don't want to really hear the, the deep issues that are affecting indigenous people. Uh, and we just had an opportunity to do that. And we were just talking about how, um, you know, those opportunities are, are fewer, few and far between. Um, this month, it seems like every phone call they want us to send a dance troupe and they want to, um, but the, the real conversations about what's happening in indigenous country from, you know, the tip of Alaska to the tip of South America, you know, from the Caribbean islands to the Polynesian islands, we're different, we have different languages, different traditions, and, um, and different things affecting us as, as indigenous people, but for the, for the most part, uh, there, 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 are, there isn't a great demand to really hear about what's what's going on uh, and a lot of uh, I would say probably this year probably 50 percent so we're at 50 50 which is better than it, it's ever been um, but nonetheless you do get those those corporations companies universities that you know want to have you come in and make a dream catcher yeah 
No, thank you both for sharing. I mean, that's, thank you for sharing your frustration, I suppose. And I, I, yeah, I feel like I've seen those kind of, for, for Native American Heritage Month, for various Heritage Month um, that have happened in the last couple of months where it's corporations want a lot of like surface level token kind of performative, whatever it might be. Um, and that's not, to me, that's not what the various heritage months are about, you know, for my own personal heritage months that I vibe with, or if it sounds like for you, for both of you for Native Month. Um, it, it's not where we're at. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and and just talking about it, which like all the great points that were brought up, like talking about the dream catcher and stuff, and it goes back to like then the extra work that is put upon Native people to bring that up and to almost like really teach that lesson unintentionally um, is really important too. Like as somebody who sits on multiple boards and like at least two of those are with, you know, all all white people and having to be the person in that space that's always like oh hey um can we talk about this or this is problematic because of this or like I feel tokenized because of this um there is a, a lot of like extra work put on you unintentionally uh and you do that work um like when it was brought up about the the dream catchers and having to to like teach that lesson like that's that's extra work too that like the majority of the time we are like glad to do but sometimes um for me on my end of like I'm not so glad to do it sometimes too but uh just like acknowledging that um and I guess that that makes me wonder one of the other questions I had that I just kind of thought of was we've been talking about like Native American Heritage Month as, I, th I think I've heard you both say, as a celebration of a month. Do you see it as a celebration or are there, do you see it more as something else or are there moments that are maybe a little more um, like honoring than celebrating? What are, what are your thoughts on that? I'm curious. Like I said, it's, it's always changing for me. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I'm more on kind of like the negative side of it because I, I get irritated a lot with the lack of uh, authenticity around, uh, especially like, cause I'm more in the outdoor community and like with people like Tiva and REI and these, these other uh, corporations. And I just see the diversity, equity, inclusion push uh, not holding up so well. Uh, like it, it was, you know, I just, I don't see it going so well. And so I get kind of more frustrated around this time of year at all of the asks that are kind of coming um, at me during this time of year. And it just is frustrating for me because I do think of the la lack of authenticity a lot around these asks and uh, how it should be happening every day of the year and how we should be having the spotlight every day of the year. Um, and so it's more of a frustration for me. And uh, I am really lucky that one year, like I kind of got to sit out because I think I was so frustrated, but I also do see uh, like what, what was spoken about is like, yeah, it's it's good to be in these spaces and to be able to teach and especially to be able to have these conversations like in this panel where we can kind of talk about the negative things and share about that, I think is really important and offer insight and then share about the, the work we're doing in our own communities, I think is really important. So I go back and forth a lot to where I am frustrated, but I can recognize that, you know, this is an important time to be able to share if we are going to um, get a platform to do it. Yes, absolutely. Um, Cliff, did you wanna add anything? I very rarely get um, an, an honoring in the, in the work out there, you know? It's very rare. Have you got any vibe it was like an honoring? They yeah, were honoring? I danced at a, a college and the police officer, he gave me like a coin of 
excellent study for it. Like he gets out one a year and he like honored it to us. And I felt like that was like authentic, like an authentic honoring. Like he was, oh, you know, he made me feel special, but otherwise not. Like, yeah, I mean, I have, I have done, um, you know, on, we've done some military installations like West Point in the past, we didn't do it this year, where it kind of felt like an honoring. For the most part, it, a, a lot of it, it, you know, it's few and far between that it really feels like an honoring. Um, more so uh, from some participants that they give you that feeling like they really, it really touched them and really, um, and so, but a lot of it, you know, sort of, you know, feels like the intentions are just kind of going through the motions of, of what they need to do a lot. Of, and, and, and from a lot of, you know, these companies too, that they realize, oh man, you know, we haven't included indigenous people. They've been something else, you know, they, and, uh, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I haven't really gotten that feeling of, of, of uh, honoring and celebration so much. Um, you know, but that feeling usually will only come when I'm with, you know, celebrating and, and honoring with, with other indigenous folk, you know. Thank you both. Um, sounds like it's a mix of a mix of a lot of things for sure. And I, um, I appreciate your vulnerability to share your frustration. I really do want this to be a, a very conversational um, panel. And if any participants have any thoughts or questions, um, keep an eye on the chat, so feel free to um, be a part of the, the conversation as well. Um, the next question I wanted to pivot a little bit um, to ask about what are your thoughts on keeping, um, we'll say, keeping intersectionality in mind um, when talking about celebrating, honoring, whatever it might be, Native American um, indigenous heritage? How do we keep intersectionality in mind? I know, Julie, you talked about you introduced yourself that you're also a fat person, you're also a queer person. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I also think that it's important to, um, you know, as Native American Heritage Month, uh, to, to recognize our indigenous uh, relatives, you know, in the so-called Americas. And those are relatives to the south of us as well, um, but also our, our Black and Native relatives and our disabled relatives um, and our queer relatives and, and kind of making space for, for all of us, especially, I mean, all of the time, but especially during these uh, celebrations um, or what is supposed to be a celebration. So I think that, um, again, back to realizing that we are very diverse communities, our nations are very diverse and different, um, but also within that, we are all very diverse and um, there are uh, fat, queer natives and disabled relatives and our relatives to the South and Black and Native and Asian and Native relatives and um, that we are all just uh, very diverse and that really I think that um, the these panels and kind of all of the spaces that we're in when it comes to uh, like Native panels should should reflect that. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for like 30 years. So I go back, you know, in a time, um, you know, I'll catch you in time, you know, so I go back in a time that uh, as an, an indigenous person from the South, um, from the Caribbean, that we were not even, I mean, I remember, I've been dancing in powerhouse for 30 years. Um, and I remember a time when, um, they wouldn't even like, there was a time when they wouldn't even let us, our drum set up. Like, you know, we had a drum called the Arawak Mountain Singers. It was the first um, Taino powwow drum. And there were some powwows that they wouldn't even give us a song. Um, so, you know, it's really nice to see, um, because I go back in the time when, um, when this wasn't, when um, it wasn't inclusive. You know, the indigenous conversations were, not what they are today. And, um, and so, 
you know, I'm really grateful that this new young generation like Julie and all these young indigenous folk are are changing the, the, the dynamics of what, what this is. They're coming together and bringing us together. Um, I remember when I pulled into Standing Rock, you know, and, and there were so many indigenous people from, uh, you know, across the hemisphere. Um, and it was really uh, moving, you know, because I remember a time when um, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, true, we are all different. Uh, in different languages, different cultures, traditions. Um, but, you know, it's this struggle that has really brought us all together in a way that no people on the, on the planet do, you know? And, um, and that's something that uh, we can rejoice in, you know, that no one, no, no people can come together the way indigenous people um, do now and have, have this entire hemisphere coming together and standing strong um, and but this is this is the work of the young of the young people you know I mean I'm gonna be uh, gonna be 60 next year and so like I'm you know my plan is I'm gonna I'm starting to back off you know and like and let these young people you know take this thing and move on and I tell that to Katie all the time <laughs> She's, Katie's like the next generation you know um, and uh, but nonetheless uh, the direction um, that's that it's going, um, I'm, 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 I'm very happy with it. It's a slow process, not going to happen overnight, um, but uh, I know it's a little off topic. But No, I appreciate that. And we're, I, I love tangents. Little tangents are great. It's like part of the conversation. All right. So the next question, um, I'm going to kind of bring in more, some, some maybe less heavy. Um, questions and discussions because we're we're about halfway through and I'm all about like not just as much as like vending frustration is is great. I'm so thankful again for your vulnerability. Um, I always like to kind of swing it back up at the end and talk about, you know, as positive or as um, supportive as things can go. So I'm curious and I think some of our um, participants are curious too, who are some of your your role models or like people in your communities that are are breaking barriers that we should be following, whether that's on social media or through the news or whatever it might be. Awesome. Um, well, my shiro and mentor is my elder, Kathy Bancroft. And uh, she doesn't really do social media other than Facebook, but she is just a really powerful woman in my community who has been um, you know, really taking Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to task over the theft of our, our water from our homelands and uh, how they've dried up our ancient lakes. And she is a fierce uh, land defender and water protector. And, uh, you know, I have two elders who, who passed, Monty and Harry, Monty Bangosha and Harry Williams. Um, and, you know, there's, there's this really wonderful core group of elders who myself and my alliance group really look up to who have supported us and who have taught us so much, um, and they're part of it. So I really look up to those elders in my community who aren't afraid to kind of go against the grain and um, who, who teach us openly and then also there are some like uh, my sister and best friend who's who's younger than I am, but I really look up to her. Her name is Autumn Harry. And if you want to follow her, um, her handle is Numu Wanderer. And she is just when I think of like indigenous youth and cycle breakers and her parents broke broke that cycle. And she's just like this really amazing person who has taught me a lot um, and does really good for her community. So I like also being able to look up to younger people because it makes me really proud and grateful to see like where our communities are heading in this kind of upward trajectory uh, that we're going in. 
And so, yeah, my elders in my community and my my bestie at slash sister, Autumn Harry, uh, those are people who I really look up to. That's beautiful. Um, and if you want to put any of those, the handles you mentioned or the names you mentioned in the chat for our participants, um, if you want to plug yourself in the chat too, um, absolutely. Um, Cliff, did you have any thoughts on role models? Yeah, um, you know, my role model um, is uh, uh, it's Pua Case, and we call Auntie Pua. Um, she was uh, one of the, the the leaders of the Mauna Kea movement in in, in Hawaii, and um, uh, uh, you know, the late um, Ladonna um, of Standing Rock. Ladonna was I was kind of you know I just loved Ladonna how tough she was, and and even you know lots of times when. Um, Things were, or people assumed things about her that weren't true. She never really lost it, you know. She taught me, um, taught me a lot of things, you know. And, and Auntie Pua as well, um, you know, taught me a lot of things. And it's funny because she's um, she's uh, also Jason Momoa's auntie, you know. And um, there are times that we're together, and um, you know, she'll. Um, you know, say, you know, my boys have not called me, you know, like if I, if we post a picture that, you know, if I post a picture that we're together, you know, and she'll say, oh, my boys are, you know, they haven't, they haven't contacted me or, you know, she's pretty funny. And, and, you know, you know, seeing her up on, on Mount Ikea and watching like the rock in awe of this like little powerful woman, you know, and, um, uh, and and also you know, a lot of the celebrities who went up there and, and who she just they you know she just didn't flinch for them didn't move like she was just she's just a rock you know for for me and um, and I learned a lot you know and sometimes I'll it, there are times I've made posts you know or, or I've said some I try not to be negative in any post but even if I did say something you know I'll get a, a message from her and she'll say Cliff I don't think you should say that or I don't think you should do that you know she'll call me. Um, I think that's a, such a great idea. Um, and so, yeah, you know, um, I, I've learned a, a lot, even in uh, my old age from, uh, from, from Pua and uh, Auntie Pua. So um, yeah, she's in this, in this work and this, in this movement. Um, uh, and she was, you know, so inspiring, you know. Um, uh, and when when her and Ladonna would be together, it was always you know something very special. So yeah, I love that. <laughs> and uh, Cliff, if you also want to put any handles of role models or uh, social media for yourself in the chat for our participants, um, feel free. Um, the next question I had was around allyship. Um, so we've maybe talked a little bit about a little bit about it, but. What does beneficial allyship look like to you both? Um, I mean, that could be specifically for for the indigenous community. That could be specifically, or that could be not specifically, just about any identities that you hold. What does beneficial allyship um, look like to you? Thinking about that, it it I think of being on a board that. I'm the only native person and there's also no people of color. So it's a native person and 10 white people. Um, and I, I think of like things that are being said there. Like somebody at one point was like, oh, this dog is my spirit animal. And, uh, you know, and having to be the person that always speaks up about that when I have friends who are also on that board that know that that language isn't isn't right, so they can also take it upon themselves to step in and maybe voice that rather than having me do it. Um, so that to me is important. That's when I know that I found an ally, um, and I I actually don't even like to use the word. I don't use the the word ally because I think that people get too comfortable in that. Um, I'm like, be my accomplice, like, let's, <laughs> uh, let's, let's do this together. But also just thinking about like, there are certain ways, like you can 
talk to your family as like a non-Indigenous person, specifically like a a white person and, you know, talk to your family members, speak up when something is said that isn't right. Um, Also like, you know, and, and I do that when I hear something that isn't right or I hear something that is homophobic or something. Um, Cause we all know that like, we, we are not exempt from those things. There there's anti-blackness in every community and there is, uh, you know, uh, homo- homophobia that shows up in every community. And so just like, no matter what, I think it's really important to be able to to stand up and say like, hey, this isn't right and this is why. Um, But specifically like in the situation that I was talking about, it's like, let's, you know, like I don't wanna have to be the one that speaks up all the time, especially when these other white people who are on this board knows that what is being said isn't right. Like take a little bit of the weight off of my shoulders and step in um, and, and do that work rather than, you know, having it, always need to be me and also apply that into whatever situation you're in you're at the dinner table with your family and you hear something you're watching tv with your family and you hear something um so to like speak up and I think that that's just like a small way that people can can work up to and and build towards being an accomplice and also in the work area. <laughs> yes, yeah, I love accomplice, yeah. Yeah, I like that too. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the ally conversation, you know, especially when um, you're, you're at actions, you know, um, uh, that has, uh, actions where these the the they've taken this 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 allyship right and turned it into something else um, it's important that we have allies in the work that we do um accomplices whatever we want to call them but it's people who stand alongside us but also you know an ally as you said you know is 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 also very quick to you know to call out uh, someone from within their their own circles, not our circles, but their circles on inappropriate behavior and and racist or homophobic behavior. Um, I think that that's that's very important. Um, but um, yeah, just pull right here. Um, I think that you know that's really important. But uh, you know, being a good ally um, is being a a a good listener. Um, and knowing, I mean, I guess, you know, really just knowing what um, stepping over that line is, you know, and uh, and I've seen a lot of allies, I mean, especially if you were, you know, if you were at Standing Rock, that was like, I mean, we saw people that were allies um, getting, um, uh, getting way over their heads in, in, in lots of, uh, and there were lots of situations where um, things like that happened, you know? So um, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with what, you know, what you're talking about with, with, with uh, allies and, 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 and accomplices. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess that's my take on it. I would like to add something. Um... I was at Standing Rock as well. I was there for almost three months at California camp. And now that we're having like this allyship conversation, um, maybe you remember this story as well. There there was an action in Mandan um, to to shut down work in Mandan. And they, um, the organizers came up with this idea that the the allies would form a barrier around native people in prayer and um the national guard was there and then it was you know allies holding hands and being this this barrier between the national guard and um the native people um who were there and so you know, one one thing that was realized that like they put their bodies on the line that day, um, like you know, like we have always been doing, and um, and nothing happened to them. 
you know, they weren't shot with rubber bullets. They, um, you know, uh, they, they were okay. And then that night at camp, there were a lot of tears and there were a lot of realizations that like, wow, we, we put ourselves it, like in between there and we weren't hurt. Like you all get hurt. And I think that they were expecting to, um, and, and it, it really offered them like this, like they could see and they could feel just how different it is between, uh, them and, and us. So I always kind of, I kind of think about that. It's like, you know, them putting their, their bodies, uh, as as a barrier and how they're likely to be a lot safer uh, than native people in prayer standing up for their their homelands. So just thought I'd share that story. You both talked a little bit about your uh, the activism you do. Um, what is I, I want to hear a little bit more, maybe like a uh, purposeful discussion about your activism and and what you're passionate about and um, just what you do and what we can get involved in. So uh, I do indigenous women hike and do in my community, like there's conglomerate Mesa, which we're fighting against the mining that um, they're trying to do there on our homeland. So organizing protests and um, just a lot of mutual aid work in my community. But my my passion and how I got involved in all of this is hiking um, and hiking the Numupoyo, also known as the John Muir Trail, and uh, just finding our indigenous place names and using those names um, and, you know, remembering them. Because I don't like to say that, you know, our ceremonies and our languages and our names are lost. I think that it, they just need to be remembered. Um, so that's the work that I've been doing. Something that felt really good this year was in 2018, on our first hike on the Numupoyo, we hiked 190 miles um, without getting off of the trail. And, you know, we hiked our mountains in prayer. And the first week, we fell a little short of one of our destinations. And we found ourselves um, at a, a lake that had a derogatory place name. And as indigenous women in this space, we we felt like, well, this isn't this isn't right. And what are we going to do? And so we sat and we had that conversation. And in a way that was symbolic, we changed the name of that place amongst ourselves. And we called it Numuhuhupi Lake, which means Paiute Women Lake. And then we, you know, got to Muir Pass, which was named after John Muir, who is a eugenist and uh, responsible for uh, the removal and genocide of Native people from our homelands. And so we renamed that First People's Pass. And if there were Indigenous place names for like so-called Whitney, uh, which is Tumangaya, which means very old man, we use those names. Um, and so that kind of Numuhuhupi is what started that, that renaming, at least on the Numupoyo. And this year uh, with uh, Deb Holland and the, the push for the name changes, our followers remembered that story that we shared with them um and and put in for our name to be the official name of that lake that we found ourselves at on the trail uh and it happened <laughs> and we got sent this this newsletter that like they chose our name for the name of that lake um and i thought that that was really beautiful and so we'll be traveling back to numuhuhupi for the first time together this coming summer to kind of have our moment and speak to that lake and let her know what happened. And I feel like that's really um, exciting. And I also wanna say like, as a fat person who hikes mountains and does all of this, I want other people to know in my community that they can stand on top of the highest mountain in the lower uh, so-called 48 and, and do that too. 
you know, and that there isn't just one body type or one um, type of person that's worthy of being recognized and worthy of, of connecting with land and our homelands, um, that all bodies belong and that the land does not discriminate. It's just people who do. So I think that that's been something that's been really exciting in my work to do is for people in my community to see a fat person standing at the top of the mountain, um, to see a queer indigenous woman. Um, and then there's kind of like great renaming or remembering that's happening of our spaces um, and the education that's coming along with it. So it's like this, this, you know, since we started traveling our homelands with Indigenous Women Hike, it wasn't like we wanted to hike and we wanted to connect to the land and we wanted this healing to happen. Um, and, and like subsequently, all of this other wonderful stuff started happening too. this renaming, um, this recognition, all of these things started coming along with it. And it's been really amazing to be a part of that. So Indigenous Women Hike is my passion, uh, my heart work, and I do a lot of other work beside that um, that is connected to it that I'm also really proud of. But I'll go ahead and put my IG handle in, in the chat um, so you could learn more about what I do with that work. Yes, please. Um, Cliff, did you want to Add anything? I know you're kind of in transit. Hey, um, yeah, so, you know, I'm the international president, the founder of, of Red Rum Motorcycle Club and Red Spirit, uh, which is our sister club. And so, you know, um, you know, we, we do work like all over in different communities and, you know, we've been to so many different sacred sites and, and, um, uh, 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 protecting water and 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 land uh, and standing up for climate change and all these different things. So um, and and going into different communities. So yeah, you know, um, I feel like uh, the work um, that that's you know that's being done um, that I that I'm part of um, is you know really gratifying, and um, I think that. Um, I've seen a lot of things change. I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of community um, come together in, in a really good way. So, yeah. I'm curious for for I mean for yourselves, for your communities, and also for our participants. Um, where do you find community or support? Are there physical spaces near you? Are there virtual spaces? Yeah, I feel really lucky because I am. I grew up on the res here in Payahunaru on one of the five reses here in Payahunaru. So I have cousins and family everywhere. So, uh, and I'm still home at home on my homelands. Um, and so if I, I need, you know, I can, I can call my cousins up and we can have dinner, watch a movie, laugh around. Uh, so I feel really lucky. And then also, um, you know, like my mom and <laughs> my my family's just just here. Um, you know, so I I feel really lucky to be like in my community here. Um, there's also, you know, there is a social media presence and a community there that I do feel. Um, but I just feel really grateful to like be in my community, being able to do work, being able to interact in in this way. Um, I also think that like, it's really like therapy is important for me and, uh, you know, and just being able to um, even have time by myself. Cause I'm, I'm one of those kind of people. Like I find my community and I love it and I'm here in my community, but it's also really important for me to have time alone um, and with my cats and with my plants and so to also just kind of share that, like, I, I love being a part of my community and going into my community, um, but I also really love that time where I wind down and I water and move my plants into the sunlight and take care of my cats and just have my alone time. Like, I really need both of those. Um, 
So, yeah. Yeah, here in New York, uh, there's, you know, of course, there's a native community here in New York, and uh, both of my nations have a huge community here in New York City. And then we also have uh, um, our relationships with the the tribes that are here, you know, the Ramapo Lenape in, in, in New, New Jersey and the Nanakoke Lenape and the Shinnecock in Long Island. And then, you know, the Pequots in Connecticut and Narragansett. So, you know, we've created this, this nice community of, of, of coming together as indigenous people. Um, and, um, and it's, you know, it's moving into virtual spaces as well. Um, so um, I think that, you know, we really developed a really close relationship with the Ramapo. They're pretty much like 40 minutes from, from where, where I live and uh, Chief Perry and we've done, uh, actually the, the chief is actually a member of our, our motorcycle club. And uh, so we, we rode with him to, took them on a, a trip across the country on our motorcycles. Um, and then uh, we went to the line three together and uh, we could go see uh, Winona LaDuke there. Um, so um, yeah, you know, although all that is you know, just intertwined with, uh, with community for us, for me. Um, but I don't think I do anything, you know, everything I do, it ends up just being like every circle I move in just ends up being tied to, you know, my indigenous roots and, and tied to uh, the indigenous communities that I'm around. Um, I struggle to find something um, that isn't, you know, just kind of ends up all being um, all connected, you know. All right, so our first question, um, which I believe was submitted by Leah, earlier. Um, and she was wondering, um, she says, I'm wondering what current events specifically, do you have any feelings or thoughts regarding ICWA and the current Supreme Court challenge? I, I mean, I guess there are so many. My uh, mentor, Kathy, um, is like the representative for ICWA in our community here. Um, and I, I don't even know. I just think as, as somebody who almost had to go through um, foster care, I was really lucky enough to have my grandmother uh, take myself and my brother in so we didn't have to like be disconnected from community or anything. And just, you know, thinking about that um, and thinking about like, what what youth what children can can face you know if this happens just it makes me feel sad um so i don't i mean i don't really know i'm just kind of like waiting watching sharing um listening to like what people like my elder have to say i mean i guess i don't really have much to to add yeah, same thing for me. I mean, exactly. I mean, I guess I also want to add. Um, I I I went to a meeting here in Paiohunaru about being an emergency or about about being a foster parent because here in our community we don't have a lot of native foster families, and so our youth here have to go outside of the valley to places like Bakersfield and Fresno. Um, and, and, you know, at least they will be with other Native people and still connected in that way, um, you know, and, but also thinking about at this workshop where I learned, you know, that I, I will hopefully be approved to be an emergency foster parent, um, that like the, the disparity in which native children are put into foster care um, because I think that it like our communities aren't really understood and how it's like a community that raises uh, a child and 
not just the the mother or the father. And here in Payahunaru, I think it's something like we make up about 11% of the population and over 60% of the children in foster care are native kids. Um, and to me, that shows that um, something isn't right, you know, um, with the way that native children are being taken out of their homes and out of their communities. Um, and I just wanted to add that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I know that's a, right. I maybe I don't know, but I can empathize that that's a heavy question. Um, and Leah in the chat says, thank you, um, for answering, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I can appreciate your thoughts so far. Um, cause I imagine it's interwoven with a lot of frustration and maybe confusion and just like exhaustion. Um, the other question I got was, uh, about from Anna about, um, what would you say are your top one or two takeaway message that you give um, the School of Social Work, whether that's faculty, staff, students that are attending this? Um, what are your top two takeaway messages that you think are important for us to consider or to continue to consider? I know it's a big question. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I would say like listening, um, listening, and even like you know, if, since it's like the school of social work, you know, just trying to, um, under, understand the, the differences, um, and what indigenous communities look like, um, between as like the, the normal, um, what I guess society deems as like a family dynamic or, or whatever is now, like, just, just listen um, and then try to like, to, to, to see and the differences between native communities and like the societal, um, of what like a, a community or family looks like, um, and to just be intentional, um, and I know this is a lot more, <laughs> but like, but listen, be uh intentional and um you know back to like questioning those family members and really just working um with yourself and and checking in with yourself and um and thinking about like what what do you think you knew about native people and how um is that was it right or was it wrong um so I don't know. My mine, I think, is more internalized. Like think think amongst yourselves and and listen and just listen for what you can do and how you can help and just be intentional um, with that self work. Yeah, like some some introspection for us for us allies or accomplices. Yeah, I like that. Taking serious the things that we're saying and how important they are, you know. Um, is important. I, 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 the things that we, the, our voices um, to be heard. And I think a lot of times um, if people are hearing us, but they're not really hearing us, you know. Um, they're, they're not taking what we're saying to heart. They're not really understanding and then, you know, you also have intention uh, and, and where you, I, I feel like a lot of times that people uh, become allies or, or are interested in what's happening in the indigenous country. I feel like a lot of times the people, um, I think they, they need to really look into the reasons that they're here, the reasons that they're, they're being, choosing to be part of, of the work or whether it's just bringing, an, an indigenous person in to speak or um, or standing alongside us as a you know, so-called ally. But for the most part, um, it's really, I think it's really important for those people to really analyze the reasons that they're there and, and what are their intentions. Um, 
Is it just for you know themselves to feel good, or do they have a deep? Uh, are they looking for deep connections within our communities, ways to serve it and, and support it? All right. Again, thank you. I'm just going to keep saying it. Thank you both so much um, for being a part of the panel today, and thank you to all of our participants for um, contributing a little bit in the chat, asking questions. Um, if there's, you know, people are very thankful in the chat. Um, if there's nothing else, then um, participants have a good rest of your evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone.